Okay, hello everyone. My name is Andrew. This is Vivek, and today we're going to talk about building cryptographic apps for human connection. So first off, why combine cryptography and human connection? Why are they such a good fit? Well, it really comes down to two things. Human connection is centered around discoverability and depth. Discoverability means finding more quantity of connections, more opportunities to connect with people. And depth is about making each one of those connections more meaningful. First off is discoverability. So many social apps today are using a push-based model. So big algorithms or advertising feeds tell you what you're going to look at. Uh, you don't really have control over what you see. And in addition, these feeds are based on maximizing how much time and money you spend on the apps. On the other hand, cryptography offers a few advantages here. You own your own data. So you get to choose how you interact with these apps. You get to choose who gets to see your data and also what types of connections you're able to find. Now, depth is another facet where a lot of social apps today are lacking. If you look at popular apps like Tinder or Instagram, these are all centered around you making a public profile that's based on who you want other people to see you as rather than who you actually are. They're not centered around connection, they're centered around your public persona. In addition to that, none of this data is verifiable. You can basically put whatever you want on your Tinder, you can put whatever you want on your Instagram, and you're crafting an image for other people to see. And as a result, this leads to a lot of fake data, a lot of fake profiles, and a lack of genuine connection. Cryptography helps this in a few ways. First off, it makes sure data is verifiable, that it has a source of provenance to it. In addition to that, because now you have access to private data, you can include a lot more meaningful sources of information within your profiles. You can include data that is more personal to you and reflects who you actually are. In addition to that, compute primitives like MPC or FHE ensure that you can still create meaningful primitives on top of this data. Okay, so why do we care right now? Why is it so important to build apps with cryptography at this moment? Well, there's really two reasons. One of them is technological, and the other one is social. First off is the technology side. As many of you uh, might have experienced last year at ZK Summit, we actually did a similar experiment with these NFC cards that you all have. Um, but actually, a lot of the tooling we have access to today it simply wasn't there a few months ago. Things like non-interactive, uh, multi-party FHE, and Trinity, both of which Vivek are gonna is going to talk about later on uh, in this presentation, they simply weren't production ready at the time. So a lot of the primitives that we really depend on are now here, and they're ready to go. In addition to that, primitives like ZK email and ZK TLS ensure that we can actually use this data today. We can take data from Web2 silos, make it portable, and include it in our applications. Finally. Consumer devices are getting a lot better. Client-side proving is becoming more important. Tools like NOR, tools like MPZ, Phantom Zone, all these are designed for computational loads on commodity hardware. And they ensure that we can actually do more meaningful computation in the devices that are in your pockets. Okay. Uh, now, the other side of this is social. Uh, it's about how social media apps have developed and evolved up until today. Uh, this is a really interesting Twitter posts, and it's about how in a recent marketing campaign, Facebook didn't mention the word friend a single time. They just didn't say it. And instead, they were talking about feeds, they were talking about content, and all this other stuff. Uh, but the original values of friends and connection that Facebook started with simply aren't there anymore. Social media today is about attention and not connection. But at the same time, people are searching more and more for a connection. Uh, maybe these are a little small and you can't read it, but to summarize, people have fewer friends today than they've ever had, uh, and they're spending more time alone today than they ever had before. So people are looking for more types of connections, but social media isn't giving it to them. So what can we do about this? What tools do we have access to? Uh, specifically, how can we use cryptography to help enable human connection? The first tool that we can use is cryptographic NFC cards. All of you are experiencing this right now. You all have these NFC badges uh, as you entered the event. And NFC is really great 
uh, for one useful primitive, which is verifiably digitizing physical interactions. I can prove to you that I actually met you in person by collecting a tap from your NFC card. There are roughly two different types of cards that we experiment that have cryptography on them. The first one is an ECDSA-based card, and the second one is a message authentication code, or Mac-based card. So we're using the second kind, which I'll explain more about later. Um, but roughly speaking, these both use cryptography to secure physical interactions. At a high level, the ECDSA cards are signing cards that actually have an internal nonce, which increments upon every tap. And in addition to that, they actually custody signing keys within the chip. So whenever you sign, whenever you get a signature, whenever you tap one of these ECDSA cards, it increments a nonce and it signs that nonce and gives you back the tap. On the other hand, the Mac-based cards use a shared secret. So basically the server has a secret that's uh, shared with the card and when the card generates this incrementing nonce tap, it just generates a Mac for it and the server verifies this tap to ensure that the tap is valid. So why do we use one card versus another? Well, at a high level, these ECDSA cards have two really important properties. They're fully decentralized because the card actually custodies the keys. So interestingly enough, these cards actually just act as full wallets. They custody signing keys, they can sign arbitrary data, they can sign arbitrary transactions, and so they act as full wallets. But on the other hand, these cards are somewhat difficult to use, namely they're expensive, they cost a lot more than the Mac-based cards, and they're also much slower. And this is the main reason why we use these Mac-based cards, the NTAG 424s for ZK Summit. It's because the tap experience is way better, takes less than a second, versus these signing cards would take uh, multiple seconds to generate a signature. And that's actually because these signing cards are generating the signature on the chip, it's a low power environment, um, and hopefully that technology can improve in the future. Okay, so to summarize, NFC is a really great educational tool. It's really tactile and physical. Uh, when someone is introduced to NFC for the first time, something we hear a lot is, oh wow, this actually feels real. It feels like you're actually getting something when you tap an NFC chip. And that's how cryptography should feel. Uh, it's really engaging and it automatically elicits human connection. When I tap you, I have to be in the same physical vicinity as you. I have to be right next to you. Uh, and so we're engaging in a physical ritual when I actually get this tap. But at the same time, NFC is not super expressive. It kind of can only express one thing, which is that we have this physical relationship. So we were looking for more ways to have programmable computation on top of this NFC data layer. And that's where we got to ZK proofs. And specifically, we use ZK for verifiable data and being able to prove things about your social graphs and about your own personal private data. So our tech stack is roughly this. We use baby jub jub signatures for NFC taps. That's what the chips give. Uh, they're ZK friendly signatures. Uh, we use ZK email and TLS notary to be able to export Web2 data and be able to use it within our applications in a verifiable manner. GROT16 proofs for efficient client side proving. And we use Nova and other folding schemes for folding multiple signatures together to be able to generate summary proofs of an entire event experience. So at a high level, these are some of the uh, experimentations we've done in the past. At DevConnect, we did events gated upon taps. So you meet the event organizers, get taps from them to actually join their event. Uh, at ETH Denver, we had prizes based on generating ZK proofs of engagement, meeting certain people, or going to certain uh, events. ZK Summit last year, we did a Spotify rap-like experience where you could fold all your signatures that you generated throughout the event into one single folding proof that represented your whole event experience. And finally, at a re recent residency, we experimented with uh, ZK email um, and basically allowed you to import your calendar social graphs from your email uh, as well as verifiable events. Uh, that you are going to attend in the future. And this allowed you to ask other people within your calendar social graph to see, hey, am I going to any events with you in common? Am I gonna see you anywhere in the future? Okay, some quick reflections on ZK. It's useful for importing personal data. You can do it in a verifiable manner. Um, but largely speaking, ZK is still limited within this social app use case. Uh, it doesn't allow full expressivity, and it's largely a single player thing. I'm proving things about myself, about my own data, to other people. And it's great for these low trust environments where I want to like limit what I send to other people, 
And this is really interesting because comparing ZK versus other tools that we'll ex uh, experience later on, ZK is centered around minimizing the amount of data that you share versus something like MPC and FHE, as we'll see, really allows you to maximize the amount of data you share and look for more connection and share everything because it can be done in a safe and privacy preserving way. So that leads us to our first multiplayer tool, which is private set intersection. All of you can experience this on the app. If you uh, go meet someone, you can see what you have in common. And what this enables is for someone like Alice and Bob who've never met to actually see what similarities they might have. How this works is that Alice and Bob's interests are both encoded as interest vectors, and this PSI primitive allows us to find the indices where both of them share something in common. So in this case, Alice and Bob meet each other, they filled out their interest vectors, PSI allows them to discover that they both are Lana fans and also are going to Coachella to see her. This expands naturally to the multiplayer <laughs> setting where Alice, Bob, and Charlie want to discover times to meet. They want to find out when they can all interact with each other and hang out. Uh, and so they all share their calendars, but they do so in a privacy preserving way. Here PSI is used to find similar times where all three of them are all available. And this leads to more effective social coordination in general in the multiplayer setting. Now, some general thoughts on PSI. It allows you to use privacy in an offensive manner. So oftentimes we think about cryptography as defensive tools used to secure your data, keep something private, prevent you from getting hacked. In this case, it's offensive. It actually allows you to share more because you can do so in a safe way and therefore discover more meaningful social connection. In addition, it's pretty easy to uh, understand and explain. PSI is largely centered around, hey, like let's just find out what we have in common. It's a very simple thing that people do anyways. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, PSI is still largely a limited primitive. It is just one interaction that you can do. Uh, it's only, hey, like, let's see what we have in common. And what we realized when we were building it is we wanted to look for more expressive forms of computation, more things that allowed you to do uh, com uh, comparisons or averages. And Vivek is going to talk to you more about primitives like that. Yeah, so this naturally brings us to more general multi-party computation. And the specific scheme that we've spent a lot of time and resources in is multi-party FHE. And the reason for this is that we're mostly building in consumer settings where liveness and compute are both kind of like bottlenecks. Liveness here uh, represents a number of back and forth rounds between two parties. Uh, because people put their phones away, um, that basically stops a computation from happening if it takes multiple rounds. So multi-party FHE has really favorable kind of rounds compared to stuff like secret sharing and garbled circuits. And the other nice thing is that it kind of offloads computation to a server. There's two main modes that we've worked with uh, multi-party FHE in. The first is interactive. And so basically there's uh, an initial MPC to set up a collective public key amongst a group of folks. So this collective public key is generated such that no individual party knows its corresponding private key. And so everyone can basically feel safe to encrypt their data to this collective key. At that point, you can send all of your data to a server, and the server can do different operations. In this case, it's just a multiply, and get some output, all you know, encrypted to this collected public key. And then finally, there's a second MPC process to decrypt this data. And so, again, this is really nice because you basically can offload all this compute to the server, but there are a lot of rounds initially and in the second phase. So as Andrew mentioned, PSI is available in this app, and actually it is built using multi-party uh, FHE because it happens to be you know, very efficient. And one thing you might notice when trying it is that like, you, we actually require both of you to opt in at the same time, so it's kind of a synchronous process. And the reason for this is that there's probably like seven back and forth rounds, and it's really difficult to build a good UX unless you require both parties to just kind of sit there and let the whole compute finish. And we've tried in the past where sort of it's more asynchronous, but then yeah, if someone puts their phone away, then basically the whole computation is blocked and it can just take a long time for any sort of like results to populate. One thing we'll highlight actually with the PSI is um, you can also in the app put in cryptographic hot takes. You can get overlap on that and you can sort of safely share those things, uh, update from these ZK11 mocks. The second mode we've started to work with is something called non-interactive multi-party FHE, uh, which I think is not quite a thing in the literature. It's something that was uh, pioneered by this group called Gauss Labs uh, that we work closely with. And it basically gets rid of this initial MPC, where instead the server generates a shared key. 
and key switches different parties' data to the shared key itself. And so this is nice because it skips this initial MPC, but also each party only needs to encrypt their data once. They just encrypt it with their own public key, and then the server can handle basically this key switching operation to bring it to the shared key. The rest of the process continues as normal. The server does some compute. There's a collective decryption process, but you do save a bunch of rounds here. So we actually built this at a recent conference uh, called Frontiers in San Francisco, and the setup there was essentially private job matching. So a candidate and a recruiter uh, could post basically a job profile and a job description privately. And every time you sort of met someone, we basically run this computation in the background to see if there was overlap in your kind of uh, the sort of encrypted data you uploaded. And we found this interesting because as a candidate, often, you know, you want to be looking for better opportunities or at least search what's out there while you're still employed at a specific place. And it's really difficult to do this in like a public fashion because you don't want to, you know, mess up any relationships with existing employers. And so this setup basically enabled this sort of stuff to happen only if there actually was an overlap. You don't need to reveal that, hey, I'm looking for a new thing. It'll only surface if like, the candidate's you know, interests and salary requirements actually fit what the recruiter has in mind. So you can imagine the candidate putting like some super high salary requirement just to see what's out there. And this actually reduced the number of rounds significantly, but there's still four rounds of communication, which means there's still kind of this weird back and forth where if Alice puts her phone away, then Bob is kind of like blocked from receiving any results. But overall, um, this is a significant improvement upon a lot of, the, of other MPC schemes, especially in a consumer setting. And again, it's really nice because the server can handle all this compute as well. And so like the user on their you know, con you know, compute limited device only has to handle generating a public key and doing encryption and decryption. One huge downside of FHG schemes in general is, especially in the multi-party setting it seems like, is the uploaded public keys are huge. Um, so to get like, you know, secure, like 128 bits of security, I uh, usually require like keys in like the tens to hundreds of megabytes. And you know, if you're kind of trying to set this up in like an app experience, this is a huge load for someone to upload, uh, even on good Wi-Fi, but especially on like, you know, something like a conference Wi-Fi or like on data. And there's also a huge uh, blow up in the data you're encrypting as well, because you're adding all this noise and other stuff to make it fully homomorphic. So uh, that brings us to um, Trinity, which is a scheme that we've researched in-house that we think answers a lot of these different requirements. In particular, um, there's kind of one round necessary of computation with one kind of initial pre-processing phase that can be used for many different MPCs. And it also comes with verifiability out of the box. The inputs that are going into this multi-party computation, um, can, you can basically verify that they you know, correspond to other data. It's called Trinity because it's a combination of three different powerful cryptographic schemes. The first is garbled circuits, basically the same one from you know, Yao in the 80s. Um, Keys to witness encryption, which is a relatively new result from 2024. And good old Plonk. Uh, actually, any sort of ZK snark that uses KZG works, but uh, we've chosen to use Plonk because it has great tooling and great performance. I'm gonna go through each of these quickly. I'll keep it pretty high level. Um, but for garbled circuits, this is essentially a general purpose uh, two-party computation tool. You can make it multi-party, but it really shines in the two-party setting. And the problem, or the reason we haven't used it before is like this oblivious transfer section here classically requires like usually three rounds. There's ways of like kind of lowering that to two rounds with some other techniques, but in general, there's basically a bunch of back and forth that needs to happen. And so again, it makes it really difficult to use vanilla garbled circuits in consumer settings. KZG witness encryption comes to the rescue here. Um, the high level API of KZG witness encryption is basically you have a normal vector commitment, you have different indices from one to n, or like roots of unity, and you're committing to some dictionary. And what you can do is you can essentially encrypt to this KZG commitment at a specific opening. So if this KZG commitment at, you know, point like index i opens to d of i, then uh, the sort of like committer can decrypt a specific encryption you make. But if that opening proof doesn't exist, then you can't decrypt. So it's basically like you can sort of, yeah, basically do these sort of like um, committing to a vector and it's all very efficient, just inquires like a few pairings and some EC moles. And the main application that uh, the authors of this paper built it for is something called laconic oblivious transfer. And so this is also kind of um, very detailed, but the rough idea here is that you can essentially batch a number of OTs into one round of pre-processing, which only shares a like constant size KZG commitment, 
And then you can use that constant size KZG commitment across many different oblivious transfers. And so if you kind of include this oblivious transfer data alongside your garbling, you just have one round total of computation, which is really, really nice for consumer settings. Finally, Plonk comes in because this KZG commitment, you can essentially attach a succinct proof of validity. In the settings we're operating in, this KZG commitment corresponds to the various parties like inputs into a garbled circuit. And by default, there's no verifiability on this. It's kind of like you're trusting the parties to put in the right data. But you can essentially, for very cheap, attach a proof, uh, like a Plonk proof, where you know, your KZG commitment at a high level can just be this first column. And you can attach a bunch of other data like ZK email, ZK TLS data, to prove that your commitment is valid. And this is all very efficient and very succinct. And so altogether, uh, basically Trinity enables this sort of like one round of data transfer to do a 2PC, uh, which again, in consumer settings is like super useful because people put their phones away basically. And in addition, you also get um, validity proofs of your data uh, for very cheap and also very small proofs, like small enough where you can you know, feasibly put them on a blockchain. The upshots of this are that Trinity, actually, we're still working on implementing Trinity, uh, should be up in a few weeks at Edge City and DevCon, so these are more kind of what we're looking forward to uh, versus reflections. But we think Trinity will enable really simple uh, developer experience and user experience for building and using uh, consumer GPC. Um, because yeah, when you don't have to think about all these rounds of computation, that's actually a huge load taken off of both the developer side and also on the user um, basically in interacting with this app. Next, um, the cool thing is because we're building off Plonk and in general any KZG based um, ZK snark, you can actually build off other ZK proven data that users have posted, whether it be in blockchains or other settings, Trinity can plug into this very naturally, uh, which is really, really neat, especially in a world where you know, hopefully people are generating more and more proofs about themselves. And maybe the overall sort of like mental model to think about with uh, Trinity is that you essentially, for Alice and Bob, Alice can send Bob this encrypted email with basically a set of criteria and some sort of hidden information. And Bob will only ever get to see the hidden information if he actually matches this criteria. And so it's kind of this combination of like witness encryption and multi-party computation. And it just enables, we think, a bunch of new kind of affordances that we will go through now. Because we think we finally sort of, through these explorations, gotten to some really exciting views of what future coordination communication could look like with, between different humans. The first one is this idea of unbreakable consent. And this actually is kind of flipping what's often thought of as a flaw of MPC, which is that parties can exit a protocol early, which basically means that for everyone else involved, they might not get the result of the computation, they might not get to decrypt in the case of like FHE-based multi-party stuff. But at least when you consider the 2PC query response setting, this actually is like a real feature in that for Alice to learn anything about Bob, um, it, like, Bob needs to sort of participate or consent to participating in this kind of decryption process for any information to be revealed. And so it's kind of like mathematically required that you know, both parties or all the parties involved consent to what is going on before anything is revealed. And this is a very, very different model from existing situations where we just kind of hope servers do right by our data. Um, which oftentimes, you know, they're training their own models, they're selling it to whoever, they're selling it to other people to train models. So this is an exciting new sort of way of existing digitally. The next is this idea of digital pheromones. So for anyone who's unfamiliar, a pheromone is a chemical substance produced by an animal to signal to other individuals to engage in some kind of behavior, other individuals in the same species. And one way we've been thinking about these sort of uh, Trinity KZG commitments, which again are sort of commitments of different people's like input data, is that there's these very lightweight, you know, they're like constant size and also like undetectable and that there's, you know, computationally hiding signals that we can start putting out into the world. And then using this sort of like encrypted email kind of like querying, we can just sort of freely discover synergy in a way that is like safe, uh, consent is like deeply baked into, and potentially just like discover a lot more sort of serendipitous synergy between people in a way that the sort of current model of social media with like public billboards really just does not facilitate very well. Finally, uh, this idea of narrow casting. So narrow cast is the opposite of broadcasting. And this kind of really builds off this sort of like encrypted email idea where instead of just being dependent on like public feeds or group chats, you can sort of just narrow cast information to the people that it would be most relevant to where you can be sure that you know, only if they match the criteria that you've set for this data could they actually see it and interact with it. 
And we also think this will enable lots of interesting ways of connecting and coordinating with people that aren't easily available right now. So where can you experience this technology? Um, all of you can experience it right now. Um, the app that all of you have, built off the NFC cards in your badge, have a bunch of these experiments. And we want to reiterate, there's some fun prizes for people on the leaderboard. And right now, the first five people who get to, I think, 33 was the number we decided, um, get to take home some NFC rings as well, um, which will be sort of early access to different experiences we're building. So at Zika Summit, we've basically kind of just like thrown a bunch of fun cryptography apps into one experience. But for Edge City, DevCon, and onwards, we're building a more cohesive single app called Cursive Connections, where you can sort of take your social graph from many different events, import data from many different places, and essentially discover new connections, you know, learn more about different people in your community, get recommended events, and sort of a kind of holistic platform for a lot of these different ideas we're exploring. If you're at either of these events, please come see us or come find us. We would love to get you a chip, get you started on this, and yeah, happy for any and all feedback. Finally, uh, we're very lucky to be hosting a really large booth at DevCon, uh, right near the entrance of the venue. And it's going to be modeled as a museum exhibition focused on cryptographic connections. So this is both like past uses of cryptography for connection, like ciphers, encryption, even like Ethereum, uh, demos from some of the sort of cutting edge projects in the space, as well as a bunch of different art exhibitions on just, you know, for different artist friends of ours, like how they interpret cryptography, connection, and this sort of thing. And we are actively trying to find collaborators to do demos, to, to make art pieces. So please reach out to us if this is something that interests you or your company. Uh, we would love to collaborate and make this cool. A little bit about Cursive. Uh, we're a research and design lab focused kind of exclusively on these directions. And yeah, this is a place that's very near and dear to our hearts. And everything we've described here has been the result of many, many collaborations. And we want to continue that going forward. So yeah, if this is a research or product area that is of interest to you or to your group, uh, we would love to try to figure out ways to work together, uh, get this tech into the hands of more people. And finally, we owe a big thank you to Privacy and Scale Explorations. Uh, Cursive is grant funded uh, from PSC, which is a sub-team of the Ethereum Foundation. Um, the grant support is amazing. It's allowed us to do very free exploration, but the network of collaborators and sort of positive sum public goods work we've been able to put out while being supported by PSC has been nothing short of miraculous. So huge shout out to them. And yeah, these are places to follow our work going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Otherwise, I guess we're at time. Oh, here we go. Let's give you one second. Thank you. Um, really interesting talk. Um, I'm just curious, what is a, um, like a ZK consumer um, product that you would like to see in the world that maybe you in particular don't want to make but think should exist? That's a great question. Um, do you have a good answer? What's up? Do you have a good answer to this? ZK consumer product. Mm. I prefer MPC consumer products. <laughs> I think, well, this is more of a shout out. Like, I think some of the stuff that the folks at ZKP2P are doing is really interesting. Um, I think that's really focusing on the verifiability aspect of ZK, which I think is a lot of sort of room to, or like a lot of value to get from that. Um, yeah, basically enabling sort of more verifiability on data exchange and that sort of thing. Um, also, especially around high sensitivity data, like financial data, passport data, that sort of thing. I would love to see more ZK on. And yeah, I think in many ways we have chosen not to focus on ZK because a lot of the stuff we're working with is more social and personal in nature and we think doesn't benefit as much from um, ZKPs as some of this other stuff. But uh, yeah, we think there's a lot of cool stuff to explore. I think last question and then left. Great talk. I um, was wondering if you if Trinity can in any way counter like the um, radaring attacks that you have with PSI, like you just create a lot of uh, sham accounts um, and try and see how you intersect with someone like with triangulation. Yeah, that's that's a great use case of this sort of verifiability, and it's a it's a big sort of bug of the current PSI. Actually, one thing I'd like to shout out is um, a project called Greco, uh, built by Timofey, is now working on new iterations of it. 
uh, off of work from Enrico and Gemma Jaya. Um, that's one that is basically doing a similar thing where it's proving that data has been encrypted correctly as inputs into a PSI, into an MPC. So yeah, ZK is a super important tool uh, in all sorts, in like all of these crypto systems in basically ensuring that the integrity of this stuff is, is, is strong because you can basically just do more meaningful computations that way. But yeah, that's, that's a great use case. Number two, thanks. Let's thank our speakers once again. Thank you very much.